Bob Bowden, and he is the executive director of Choice Media. Michelle Lavelle, I'm going to quote her. She says, this is the number one place to look for education issues around the country. Bob Bowden. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yes, thank you. It's my first uh, morning in New Hampshire ever, as I was saying before, and it's wonderful to be here. And I, I wanted to just say I had a, uh, this morning I went to have breakfast up on the hill at the cafe there, and an unusual thing happened. I went to, uh, I ordered my eggs, I sat down, and then I noticed there was no uh, Wi-Fi service uh, I was getting on my phone, and I wasn't getting any data service either on my phone. So I said, all right, well, I'll just go old school, and I'll just find a newspaper and read that, and then they didn't have any newspapers there. And I actually had to just, like, look out at the mountains and think. In other words, I don't know if you're, if you're following me, but there was no social media. I had no updates on what people had for dinner last night. I had no, uh, you know, like whether they had run out of toothpaste, was not like a tweet or something that I'd gotten. I basically had to just sit and think, and I, I kind of thought like, this is like when fashion designers go abroad and they, figure, they see the latest thing is this cool scarf in Malaysia and they bring it back to New York City and it's the hottest thing ever. Like, I may try to bring this thing back to New York City, like this idea of like thinking like without noise and distraction. Uh, but anyway, I don't know if it'll take off. They'll probably reject it. Uh, but anyway, but thank you for coming. So, um, and it's great to be here. And I, I do find myself just uh, kind of viscerally unwinding my uh, anxiety being in the, you know, away from the city here. So I appreciate it. Um, so we do uh, education reform. I, I run a group called Choice Media, and we are uh, we take a look nationally at education. It, we create uh, video and films and podcasts that are original. We also aggregate content from across the country. And so if, if I'm going to leave you guys with something here, it's that this issue is exploding right now across the country in very different ways in different states. There are some issues that are national, and it, my experience has been when people start to become aware of all that's going on in this space, you know, if you're a person who regularly, say, follows politics or regularly follows other things like sports or the stock market or other things because you're just kind of interested in what's going on, if you just get a little taste of this education reform news flow, the daily newswire we publish or other people publish, I think you'll get addicted. It's the most important issue in America that receives too little attention, and I want to show you some of that this morning. Thank you. So, uh, again, this is my name. If you want to follow me on Twitter, please do. It's more important probably to follow our newswire, Choice Media TV, on Twitter because we have the most robust Twitter news feed uh, on the Internet, and, and so... Uh, please check it out. So let's talk about what's going on. First of all, where are we? Where is the United States when it comes to uh, our quality of education? And we'll start with my how are we doing there. And first, a disclaimer. Sometimes when you talk about how we're doing, it's an important disclaimer, uh, you have to use some sort of measures, which often means tests. And to a lot of people, uh, they may define education differently than other people might define it, all right? So I am very open to, as you'll see a little later in the talk, brand new ideas, innovative ways to think about what education is, and that our old school way of measuring progress may in some ways be outdated and may in some ways be limiting, and we need to broaden our view of what education is. So, so that's my disclaimer. Now let's go to the kind of uh, traditional ways of measurement to see what's going on. So a PISA test, it's a test given around the world, the most recent one in 2012, uh, was given to how many countries? 65 countries. Imagine, 65 countries around the world. 15-year-olds taking the same test. And, and there are their language tests too, but they often vary by culture a lot uh, more, so it's a lot harder to compare them. If you look at something like math, though, that compares much better internationally. And the world average score of 65 countries, 494 on the math test. Our 15-year-olds, 481. We were tied for 30th in the world in the math score of the PISA tests around the world. All right, so just let that soak in for a second. We were beat by some of the uh, countries you might suspect, the usual suspects, so to speak, uh, Shanghai, province of Japan, uh, of China, excuse me, Japan, Hong Kong, South Korea, uh, Singapore, Netherlands, those kind of countries beat us. But you know who else beat us? This is just a couple of years ago, our 15-year-olds. Well, 
Latvia beat us, Estonia beat us, Poland beat us, Vietnam beat us in math, in education. So imagine 29 other countries, it's a huge list. They're not all developed countries. They're not all rich countries. Why would their 15-year-olds be doing better than ours? And so, and so that's something for you to think about first. That, that's a test score, and I know some people uh, you know, might, might quibble with whether that really measures what's important. Well, here's another, well, let me just, uh, first, excuse me, let me use some reactions. So this is a guy who thinks more like I do, Mark Tucker, who said the current education reform agenda is bankrupt. He says, there's no evidence it can, can succeed. It's time to embrace a very different education reform agenda. Well, we'll see what that might be. But then this is what I really want to show you. This is the teachers union president of the American Federation of Teachers, Randy Weingarten. It's the second largest teachers union in the country. Sadly, our nations ignored the lessons from the high-performing nations. She says, these countries deeply respect public education, work to ensure teachers are well-prepared and well-supported, and provide students not just with standards, but tools to meet them, like ensuring a robust curriculum and addressing equity issues so children with the most needs get the most resources. So to Randy Weingarten, the teachers' union president, it, it's a lot about poverty, right? So that's why, in her opinion, Vietnam is beating us in education because their poor kids much get, must get more resources given to them. Or in places like Estonia or places like some of these other places that spend a fraction of what we do. America basically spends the most in the world per student on education. Depending on, there are different metrics by which this is measured. Some would say Switzerland sometimes beats us. You can measure spending per capita of the whole country. You can measure spending per student. You can measure um, uh, uh, spending by, uh, in a school, basically adjusted by school. So there, you know, and there are different special needs allocations, different ways of measuring it. But we spend in the top one, two, three, however you want to measure it, of the world. And yet we're 30th in math, all right? So that's something to look at. Um, and now this is not something that's a test for tell. This is simply high school graduation rates. And what you see here is, uh, and th this was actually released this year, just in case it looks like old data. It takes a few years to crunch the numbers on, on high school graduation rates. But in fact, our high we've reached here is 81%. So I would just ask you to think for a second about one out of every five, 20% rounded off, 19, 20%, one out of every five kids in America not even with a high school diploma in 2015. I mean, this is an era when a lot of people will say you pretty much need a master's degree to be competitive in, in, a, in a job, especially a high tech job or whatever. Uh, what if you not, don't have a master's degree and you don't have a bachelor's degree, but you don't even have a high school diploma? That's one fifth of our country. And there will always be a few jobs out there for completely unskilled labor. There are, uh, hotel maid jobs and garbage man jobs and certain jobs that really don't need much education. But it's nowhere near one out of every five kids in America, particularly with an increasingly technological age. I mean, it's, a, it, this is a, it's really a nightmare for American competitiveness. I mean, this is, so, so decide what you want about tests. We have basically not only 20% of, of high school kids not finishing, we have certain cities with 50% of the kids dropping out of high school, major cities. Half of the major cities in the country with 50% dropout rates. So what to do? So here are a few bullet points, and these are the basic things I'll talk about today. Traditional public school education reform, number one. School choice, number two. This kind of by school choice, I mean the uh, vouchers, charters, tax credit scholarships, education savings accounts, those kinds of school choices, and homeschooling, those things. Three, Common Core, which I'm sure will be very popular in this crowd. We'll talk about the Common Core. And number four, more innovative models, all right? So let's go to some traditional public education reform. And this is where I'm actually gonna pull up the web browser and just show you guys some news stories I was looking at today. And I wanted to start locally. Uh, this, uh, we're calling, I'm calling this traditional education reform because this is about school choices amongst regular public district schools. Pleas for school choice rejected in Manchester. And I'm sure Kate Baker and some other uh, New Hampshire experts can tell you a little more about this. But we see, while well, the Board of School Committee, this is the star chamber of geniuses, I'm sure, in the state who uh, we go to, you, you guys in, Manhattan, in New Hampshire would go to for guidance and you know, wisdom, rejected an attempt to reverse, uh, oh, excuse me, I, got, I, got the, I framed that wrong, didn't I? They rejected an attempt to reverse a, a district decision to rescind school choice 
So I guess this means they supported school choice, right, in Manchester? No, they killed it. All right, so sh shows how much I'm, I'm, I'm up on this one. But uh, the bottom line is um, Janine Sorrentino says she found out her child would switch schools after the school year ended, and I found out when it's too late to fight this. There are kids with special needs who, for whom school choice is especially important, like apparently in this family. And uh, so this is a, a fight going on about whether kids should get to go to different public schools uh, within a district or cross district lines. I just wanted to quickly start with that because it's local. Uh, let's move on to some other places. So this now we go to Kansas where um, uh, this is uh, traditional district reform. It's about teacher tenure. Now, there are places all over the country where, in fact, uh, you can't lay off a teacher uh, or fire a teacher unless they're literally convicted of a felony. I mean, one example I give is in uh, California, Mark Burnt was a high school teacher who was actually uh, on trial for uh, a, a, a case of multiple child sexual molestation. He'd been arrested, his trial was awaiting, they wanted to fire this elementary school teacher uh, I won't tell you what he did. You can look it up if you want online. Just search Mark Burnt, Los Angeles. But the fact is that even that guy, to get him out of the system, the school district of Los Angeles paid him $40,000 to quit. This is a guy, he hadn't been convicted yet, but he had been charged with multiple cases, and the evidence was overwhelming. Multiple cases of child sexual molestation and abuse and that guy they couldn't fire without paying him $40,000. That, that gives you an example of where we are in, in terms of teacher tenure. Uh, here's a case in New York that I found amazing. Judge rules that the, the uh, teacher's exam is racially biased. So this is an exam they gave to uh, teachers to, to let them become teachers. It's a, a liberal arts exam, basically. I just want to show you what it is. is it's, a, it's the second incarnation. And basically, it was given to teachers to see if they, you know, know who Shakespeare is, stuff like that, right? The test was found to fail minority teaching candidates at a higher rate than white candidates. And according to this decision, the pass rate, well, they give you the disparity in pass rate, 75% um, for white teacher candidates, 54% for minority. And once it was established that minority applicants were failing at a disproportionately high rate, Basically, the test was ruled discriminatory. So was there a question that was considered racist on this test? No, not a single question found to be racist or discriminatory. Simply the fact that there was a different pass rate was all the evidence they needed for the second time for these judges to rule that these tests were discriminatory. Uh, if I'm talking about a traditional public education reform, I also want to just quickly touch on the 2016 presidential race because just recently it was announced that Hillary Clinton said I'll be listening to teachers and you guys should know this is kind of have has been a a fissure or a rift within the Democrat Democratic Party in terms of whether um, uh, to what degree school choice and charter schools will be supported for example so in uh, just a few years ago Bill Clinton spoke at the National Charter School Conference many of you know that Barack Obama has supported charter school growth, although he opposes private school choice support in many ways. Uh, to many, this kind of signal uh, indicated that uh, Hillary Clinton would be, once again, like she did in her 2008 run, looking for the teachers' union money and probably saying things or making promises that they will like. Uh, let's talk about this. This is uh, Pennsylvania. The House, you know, Pennsylvania is one of those states where it's actually the only way, you cannot uh, consider anything except seniority if you're laying off teachers. This is in America today, 20, 2015. If your enrollment drops and you're in a regular public school district in this state, you can only lay off teachers based on, I mean, imagine taking this to a bank or, a, you know, a software firm in Silicon Valley or, you know, an insurance firm somewhere. Like, hey, we got a new rule for you guys. What do you think? We're going to make it to where if you ever have to lay someone off, it always has to be the most recently hired, even if they're working really hard and working their butt off every day, and even if someone who was hired a year before them is completely phoning it in. This is what we have in, uh, in many states across the country, and so this is just the House that's passed this, by the way, in Pennsylvania, but the governor, Governor Wolf, has said, well, he's, he's uh, skeptical of this. He wants more accountability, 
but he believes issues of seniority should be part of collective bargaining. So how long you've worked should matter, uh, not just if you're doing a good job. Um, you know, pre-K has been a latest uh, 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 effort on the part of the education establishment. What they want to do is, and Barack Obama supports this, by the way, too, and, and many uh, main, uh, major cities and states, Bill de Blasio of New York City, for example, as a mayor, just uh, got a large pre-K program approved. Uh, the fact is, is that the evidence shows you can't tell uh, by third or fourth grade which kids had pre-K education and which kids didn't. In other words, this is for three-year-olds and four-year-olds, um, one of which I thought I heard there in the audience. Uh, <laughs> young, this is for young kids. Uh, in fact, Chris Christie famously referred this, to this as babysitting and got a tremendous bit of pushback for that. Uh, Pre-K is basically a way to throw money at the unions. You create this new gigantic hiring binge of certified teachers uh, to stand and, in my opinion, you know, mostly do uh, coloring and stuff like that with uh, three-year-olds and four-year-olds into what many uh, would describe as daycare. I mean, when the federal government most recently closed down, um, the stories about the impact of the federal closure uh, on the, during a budget battle uh, portrayed a woman who basically didn't say, I'm worried about my preschool kid not getting education. She said, I'm, I'm, I, I don't know where to put my kid when I go to work now, described it as a kind of a daycare model. Um, so then they, they get particularly annoyed when they see stories like this, don't they? A study that shows that if a kid watches Sesame Street, that's as effective as pre-K. All right, uh, let me get to a few more stories in this regard. Um, and I guess I'll tack now to some more school choice talk, which is really my bread and butter. Uh, it's what, are, what I kind of care about and work on most. Um, there are many states around the country that have uh, passed uh, uh, voucher or tax credit scholarship uh, laws um, or education savings accounts, which is kind of a new version of all that. Uh, and so what happens, though, is a tremendous pushback happens when these, these laws get passed. So uh, uh, what we see is examples like this in North Carolina, where just last year they started a brand new voucher program to help kids who were stuck in chronically failing schools. Uh, they had enormous, uh, enormous subscriptions. There was huge demand for this. Parents all around the state wanted it. But what happens is uh, when the teachers unions and the education establishment loses these kinds of political battles, oftentimes the next stage is they try to sue it out of existence. And this is what's been happening in, uh, in North Carolina. They lost, the teachers union lost the first round of suits to stop their voucher program there. But they're now appealing, and so it kind of keeps these programs keeps these programs in limbo. Uh, by the way, just as an aside, oftentimes if they even lose all the lawsuits, then they try to regulate these programs out of existence and try to regulate them so they're so ineffective and bureaucratic that parents don't know how to sign up and what to do. Um, so similarly, this is another case, another lawsuit. This is against a tax credit scholarship in Florida, Florida with the largest tax credit scholarship program in the country. By the way, also the largest online learning program in the country where uh, any student in Florida can take a course for free uh, over over 100 courses uh, for all kinds of grades. If you want to take Algebra 1 or, or uh, English 2 or uh, a history course or a lower elementary course online, it's free if you're a public, if you're uh, a parent of a normally a public school student and they want to opt out because Mrs. Smith is not a good geometry teacher, I want to take that one course online instead, you can do that in Florida and it's free to that parent. If the kid is in a charter school and they want to take that one course, that's free. If, you, if the kid is completely homeschooled in Florida, 100% free for all students. Uh, and and anything else. They can take uh, just, again, one course or a whole suite of courses online, and it's counted exactly the same by law in Florida. In fact, the, the providers of the online learning options only get money when the kid successfully passes the exam showing they've learned the material. So this, yes, well, thank you. I mean, it's, it's, it, it basically, I mean, look, a lot of what I'm talking about here, folks, is a outputs model instead of an inputs model. Like for the last two couple generations in America, uh, 
teachers unions and the education establishment says, throw more money at this thing, give more inputs to the system, create more rules about teacher certifications, create more rules about the courses you have to take, or these curriculum rules about which textbooks you have to use. And if we just shove more money and shove more rules in the front of the system, we're going to hope that what emerges out of the backside is positive. Uh, you know, the essence of the education reform uh, movement and the school choice movement says, let's, let's measure the outputs instead. That gets controversial when you start talking about uh, possibly over-measuring the outputs and creating a one-size-fits-all common, common core type footprint. We'll talk about that in a second. At any rate, so what we have here in Florida is a tax credit scholarship case where, once again, just like North Carolina, uh, it's been appealed by the teachers' unions, and we're going to have to see what happens there. Um, Another quick aside, by the way, all these stories I'm giving you, look at this, June 15th, that was, I think, last week. I'm showing you all stories from the last week or two. Uh, this, uh, this news flow is moving at a rate that's remarkable. And so um, I just want to kind of point that out, too. Uh, uh, so th the biggest news in, in uh, school choice, though, I would say, policy-wise, is something called education savings accounts. It started in Arizona, then passed in Florida. Uh, a few states uh, since, uh, and including Tennessee. The latest example is Nevada. And, and, and let me just tell you a little bit about what education savings accounts are. Now, I'll hit this. Uh, well, here's the story. Governor Sandoval in Florida talking about education savings accounts. So if you can imagine, I don't, uh, do you guys know what vouchers are? I mean, raise your hand if you know what a school voucher is. All right, so good. So it basically says, here's an amount of money. If you opt out of the public schools, you can have this money and take it to a private school. And the private school uh, cannot participate at all if they don't want. Or if they do want to participate, they have to take that voucher as the tuition for the student. So you have statewide voucher programs in Indiana, Louisiana, Ohio, uh, Wisconsin. You have certain cities like Washington, DC, with voucher programs. That's kind of the first form of private school choice uh, that emerged. But understand what it does. It sets a tuition price, right? So it's the government setting the price that schools, all the private schools who participate, then accept that government set tuition price. Education savings accounts doesn't do that. It says, let's just give the parents a pot of money. And this now can create pricing pressure on the part of schools, because if they charge a little less because they're really efficient, in their school to the parent, then the parent saves more of that education savings account for a college fund, or for an online learning program, or for something else they might do, like uh, hooked on phonics uh, they want to buy, or they want to buy a Rosetta Stone for their kid, or they want to uh, just uh, use it in, in an other, a different educational way. So education savings accounts does that. Voucher programs and most of the education savings account programs before said, we're going to give this to low-income kids because they're the kids that really need it. This was the thinking. And they have some of the most troubled regular public schools. OK, so uh, in Nevada, they said, you know what? Let's get rid of that. Let's not make it just for this kind of kid, just for that kind of kid. Just, you know, so sometimes these things are passed because the, the politics are such that, it, like Arizona did, if you launch this for just special needs kids, it's much harder for the union to oppose it politically, right? You're against these special needs kids from having it. If you, if you launch a, a voucher program uh, just, for, uh, just for special needs kids, like the Oklahoma voucher or the uh, Georgia voucher or the Florida McKay voucher originally did, just for special needs, it's really hard to oppose it politically because you're opposing parents of special needs kids. Uh, so that's why sometimes it was done that way originally. But in Nevada, they said, you know what? It shouldn't be just for this one kid or this other kind, one kind of kid or this other kind of kid. Let's make it for everybody. Everyone, every kid in the state now, in Nevada, based on this new plan, this just happened. Look at the date, June 16. Basically, these kids uh, get fi over $5,000 to just opt out of the public schools and use it for private school tuition. They can go to a Catholic school. They can go to a, a secular private school. They can go to some other. Uh, they can. They can Use it for online learning expenses, for example, uh, if you want to homeschool. So this has been considered really the most exciting development in a long time. And it just happened in Nevada. And so this is really important. I want to talk about that. Um, OK, so a little bit on Common Core, because I'm, I'm, I'm covering a lot of ground here, I realize. So uh, I've been 
debating against Common Core around the country. I just had a debate two weeks ago against Mike Petrilli, who's kind of known as the nation's leading Common Core proponent. Um, uh, I, had, I had a debate against him two years before in Chicago, which is kind of funny because in some, I started out by saying, you know, in some ways this debate is over. The, the, the backlash against Common Core is so extreme that uh, no one's going to be left supporting it very soon. Uh, who, do you guys know what Common Core is? Raise your hand if you're familiar with Common Core. All right. Yeah, I got more of that than, than the voucher. It's interesting. Um, so uh, I mean, the good news about Common Core is I believe very soon there'll be no president. The, the, the next president is, it's hard to meet him, for me to imagine the next president supporting Common Core, whoever it is. Why? Because Hillary Clinton is now in, has basically said, almost said she's in bed with the unions, and the unions are against Common Core. They're against it because it involves testing students, and that testing is often applied to teacher evaluations, and they, are, they don't want anything to do with rigorous teacher evaluations. So the unions are against Common Core, and Hillary Clinton's holding hands with the unions. She's going to be against it. And then you look at the Republicans running. I mean, there were, used to be a few Republicans supporting it. I guess you could, arguably Jeb Bush and John Kasich might be the ones left who are supporting Common Core a little, but even they have backed off their strident positions. And if, and if you look at guys like Bobby Jendel and Chris Christie, they have absolutely 180 degrees reversed their position on Common Core. They were absolute supporters and have now denounced the plan. And so, um, you know, we could do a whole hour on Common Core easily, but um, uh, the point is I don't think a lot more people were supporting it. Um, uh, you know, if, if, you're for, if you're for accountability, uh, in some ways, the education reform world is divided between the autonomy group and the accountability group, right? So some believe that uh, these districts and schools should be autonomous, don't tell them what to do. The federal government or the states are too uh, proscriptive, they're too bureaucratic, they have too many rules, and this is stifling innovation. You should, you should leave different schools alone to kind of have their own laboratories of excellence. And, and, and they're, they're autonomy people. The accountability people say, look at these failing districts who are chronically failing with 50% dropout rates for decades. We need to hold them accountable. So somehow, they are getting taxpayer money. Let's give tests. And that way, we can prove when they fail the tests, we can take money away from them as a way to enforce accountability. So. Um, you know, often it's the, it's the unions and the establishment that, that uh, uh, you know, they, they certainly want nothing to do with accountability, right? So uh, uh, they oppose it for that reason, obviously. But for an education reformer who believes in, in accountability and autonomy, like I do, where I come down on it is if a traditional district school is uh, getting students and monies without any proactive act on the part of the parents, if they're just being awarded children and money, uh, in, in my view, they should be held to account through some sort of testing that would be developed either by states or districts themselves, and, but not a one-size-fits-all national Common Core footprint. So I believe in tests and, and, uh, given to those kinds of schools. If you want to innovate and be a charter school or a private school or a home school or an online school that does your own thing but parents proactively choose you, then I'm for just open the doors and let's see what happens. So that's kind of where I stand on this. But, but uh, nevertheless, it's hotly debated around the country. This is kind of interesting, isn't it? So this is the uh, Oregon governor saying, uh, in fact, we want to let our parents opt out of Common Core because we know that that's a popular position. But uh, please don't. <laughs> Why does she say that? Because the federal government has what's called no child left behind waivers they give to certain states. All right, we won't punish you for failing schools if you make a bunch of promises in a letter to us. And so the, the states write these letters and Oftentimes, they promise 95% of kids will take the Common Core test because the federal government likes to hear that kind of that, that's their threshold of, you know, uh, of test takers. And so, you have them making the, they're they're fearing uh, a withdrawal of federal money, and so they make these promises of 95% uh, test rates. And so that's why. But at the same time, they're getting pushback locally from these parents saying, "Why don't you let me opt out? I desperately need to opt out." So you have these kind of anomalous statements like this from, or almost kind of self-contradictory statements from governors like this. Um, and here you have, uh, you know, pushbacks even bigger from the Arkansas governor, Hutchison, saying, you know, look, I am saying that we can just kick out this park test, which is this one of the set of Common Core tests, 
Uh, and so I'm just going to do it, even though the state the Board of Education doesn't agree with me. Too bad. I'm the governor. I say we can jump out of this park thing and just dump it. So the, the backlash is, is large and continues in terms, of, uh, in terms of Common Core, and those are examples of things like that. Um, and, and last, let me get to uh, one of my other favorite topics, which is uh, completely innovative schools. So I was at a, a talk a few weeks ago, uh, and I heard about a school. It started in Texas. It's called Acton Academy, A-C-T-O-N. And the founder of the school gave a an, an really interesting story. He'd been a super successful uh, professor of business at University of Texas, and he'd then been an independent businessman, made, you know, made money and done well. He had, he had some kids, and he had kids in a private school that he could afford that was like a top-rated private school in Austin. And, uh, and actually, they were homeschooled first, and now he was deciding it was time to put them in a school, and he was applying for, uh, he was having a meeting with the top-rated private school in Austin. That's, that's the way to put it. And so, he was, and so he was meeting with these folks, and he um, he's with the principal of this uh, you know, school. And, and so he explained, yeah, my kids have been homeschooled. I want to you know, put them in the school. And the principal said, well, it's going to be really hard. If they're homeschooled and they're used to having this freedom to learn whatever they want to learn, the, now, you know, make, the idea of making them sit down for eight hours a day in a chair, I'm just telling you, it's going to be really hard to make them sit there all those hours. And the guy just blurted out, he said he felt it was rude later. He just blurted out, well, I don't blame them. Like, why would they want to, why would they want to sit in this chair for eight hours? And then the principal of this private school, this elite private school said, you know, I don't blame them either. And he, and he realized, he said he had this moment, this like light went off. He's like, now it's time to do something different. Like, we got to we got to totally reinvent this thing. The idea that, that, that what's good for kids who naturally want to learn in their own way is to force them into this like cattle uh, pen where they, they sit in, in a chair for eight hours in this unnatural way. So he started a school called Acton Academy. Basically, I can't do it justice right now, but you can research it yourself. The kids end up grading each other, all right? They have, they, uh, they're basically, they ask questions of the teachers, but they, what, they, what they learned was, in, in essence, is that what kids really want to do is they really want to be with their friends and do the thing their friends are doing. If their friends want to hang out on a street corner and like, you know, join a gang, they'll be inclined to do that. They're social animals. But if, the, if you create a culture in a school where their friends are learning and trying hard and challenging each other, if that's the culture you can create, the kids will all want to be part of that culture too because that's what their friends are doing and that's what they think is cool. And they've created this. It's now blossoming all over the country. Another model that's not too far from that is called the Sudbury Valley Schools. Started in Massachusetts, now all over the country. In fact, internationally, there's uh, uh, these Sudbury Valley Schools. This one, I just learned about today. This is a charter school in Oregon, not with a very similar kind of thing where students are shaping their own world and their own environment. I mean, this is, uh, there, there's a huge amount of energy going into rethinking this stuff from the ground up. And so I just want to let you guys know it's happening. I think between that and online education, which if you've looked at MOOCs at all, massive online open courses, you can take free courses from the nation's best universities. You can do it, anybody at a library anywhere in the country or your own internet access could take MIT, Harvard, University of Chicago, Stanford courses, the list goes on and on. And this stuff is the really cool stuff. This is what's really gonna be the, I think, uh, you know, disruptive technology when it comes to education reform. And so, uh, anyway, I know I covered a lot. I jumped around here around the country, but I want to leave some time for Q&A. Uh, and one other thing, though, before, so in case I don't uh, mention it, so I have cards down here. I only present them when I speak. These are choice media uh, for our films, and, and our films have won 13 film festival awards and Warner Brothers distribution and... Uh, uh, national theatrical releases, uh, two of the films actually, The Cartel and The Ticket, uh, the first being about corruption in public education, the second being about educational options. Anyway, we have discount cards here uh, for the, our films. If you're interested in ordering that and also joining us on, on Twitter, Facebook, whatever, these cards are here for when I'm done. But that said, thank you for the attention and I'll take some questions. Thank you. Um, so this idea I love that you just talked about um, where kids who I guess are interested in building their own 
curriculum or whatever it is that they should be allowed to do it. And that's going on in the schools. So I wonder if you have an idea of how teachers are going to fit into that program, given the strength of the teachers' unions and the preparation of the teachers, right? How does that fit in? Right, so, so teachers have this conundrum sometimes where they, on the one hand, they hate being uh, told what to do with the, with the curriculum that every day says you've got to do this and this and this. Because, you know, and, and not only the fact that with discipline problems, there are a lot of teachers that are told to just deal with it in the classroom, even though there's one or two disruptive kids that are ruining the environment for everyone else. At private and charter schools, they just remove those kids. That's what they do, just do it. And yet, in often public schools, these teachers, and in this regard, I'm sympathetic, are told, deal with it. Yeah, they cannot. Right, they can't. And so, I mean, right there, that, th this is, I think, an enormous problem in traditional public education. So you have, you have teachers that, are, that basically, uh, you know, like the idea of kind of uh, uh, more freedom, but, but uh, at the same time, they're worried about, and they've grown up in and in, in, uh, become almost inured to a culture where they're given all these job guarantees, and you tell them then, with this freedom comes the fact you have to perform as a teacher, and they're, they're frightened by that. It's just not the culture they know. Exactly. Yeah. So how will it work? That's my question. Like I like to say a lot of times, that teachers are not a monolith. So many teachers just say, bring it on. Others absolutely want nothing to do with, you know, evaluations that, you know, in their mind, until, until a 100% fair evaluation system is developed, and anyone who's worked in private industry knows, <laughs> there's always subjectivity in any evaluation system, right? right? They're going to be racist, right? Right. So there's always this idea that, uh, that, well, if I sign on to that, to this Bob Bowden school choice, let different schools hire and fire who they want plan, I'm going to have some, some principal show up someday who doesn't like you know, the cut of my jib, and I'll be out the door. I've got to be against that. I've got to just be for these jobs for life. And so you've got a huge percentage that believe that way. Um, and so I, I guess the answer, there is, no, there is no one answer of how teachers will respond. I just think what's happening is as more and more parents line up and vote with their feet for charter schools and private school options, it just becomes a larger and larger movement. I mean, it's 100% or over 90% charter schools in New Orleans today. Uh, Detroit, 65% charter schools. Washington, D.C., 44% charter schools. Uh, Philadelphia, a third of the kids go to charter schools. So these are huge footprints in these places where there is no tenure. And as, as those, in those cities in particular, as the pop, those populations get larger and larger, I think it just becomes woven into the culture more deeply and harder to oppose. Okay. All right. Let's remind people about the panel tomorrow also. Oh, yes. So there's, uh, there's a panel discussion tomorrow and, uh, at 11 a.m. And perhaps you can uh, tell people who's going to be talking there. Right. So I'm going to be one of the, the panelists. Uh, Maya Yaakov over there is going to be on the panel. Um, Michelle Lavelle. And we were originally supposed to have Brett Vinat, who runs uh, School Sucks podcast, but he had a family emergency and he had to go home. So we're trying to find another person and we don't know who that is yet. Okay. I, I know, yes, I, the School Sucks podcast sounds like fun, huh? Yeah. Um, uh, okay, go ahead. So. Hi, good morning. I just want to say that um, I'm not a former public school teacher, but I did a lot of subbing and I've talked to teachers literally across the country. I have family members who are teachers, and I have not heard one teacher who's not absolutely stressed to the max and upset to the max. And the, you know, the statistics are showing that fewer and fewer uh, people are going into teaching. Sure, that's um, true. And that the average lifespan of a teacher is about five years. So that, what I would like to say is that too much of the pressure and too much of the fault is being put on the teachers, and I just don't think that that's right. I don't think that that's fair to the teachers who are working under such difficult situations, and being a teacher is a really, 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 really hard job. Yeah. So, and so that when you're talking about a public situation, you're bringing in the whole society, and so that you can't just... It's not just the teachers' union, it's not the teachers, it's, it's a much bigger picture than that. And um, I love education, I love learning, 
So some of the some of the options that you're talking about are, you know, they're they're exciting to me. But um, I have, I really, I am really feeling for the teachers th these days. So that's just a commentary that I wanted to make. Sure. All well, right. this, look again. I, I don't think I don't think they're a monolith, and I think so. There's there's all kinds of different teachers, right? But but I think that I, 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 the ones I find most excited about their jobs are the ones given the most freedom, yes. right? And the ones given the most freedom are the ones in schools that are allowed to innovate because they're outside of the bureaucratic strictures. And so, I mean, I, what would it look like? Imagine for a moment uh, if if we needed massive reform in public education around the country because we have, you know, only 80% kids graduating from high school and we're 30th in the world in math. Imagine we really need massive change because before all this education reform started, we were still doing worse and worse and spending more and more. You'd have to imagine that there would be teachers who would have to be told goodbye, right? There would be a certain uh, population of those people who weren't doing a good job that were told, uh, we don't need your services anymore, maybe you should be doing something else. And maybe another group that actually are doing a good job, but they've never been exposed to the culture of evaluation and they are fearful of that. And so it would only seem logical to me that be a certain amount of pushback simply because change always elicits pushback. Uh, you, the only way to not get pushback is to just keep going down the same path we were going where our graduation rates were getting worse, we we're just spending more and more, and we still are just sinking farther and farther in international ratings. Uh, so, so when I hear stories of concern on the parts of teachers uh, like, like you gave, I am both sympathetic and at the same time also I feel like some of that has to happen. It is inherent to reform that you have people who are uh, aggravated, annoyed, believe we should just stop all this reform completely and go back to the way it was because they were more comfortable that way. It, to me, it, the, both, things, both things can be true. Uh -huh. I'm a, actually currently a student in a public school in high school over in New Jersey, which as you know is Common Core. Strongly, Christie's drawn to... Which reverse, town in New Jersey? Uh, right near New Brunswick, Franklin Township, Somerset okay. County. All right. So I was homeschooled and I, was, I put myself into the high school just, just as something to do, just to see what this was. I get kicked out, I enjoy it, but I have talked to the teachers before. It's very easy to see that they are drained completely. They are drained sympathetically, they are drained emotionally, they're just drained, like, they just don't, they want to care, but they can't with the system being set up as it is. The staff can't talk on against the system because they're afraid of getting fired, because I'm with the newspaper of the school, and I'm the one, the, the douchebag has to write the story about if students are over-tested or not and they won't give me their input because they, are, they know if they gave their true statements, they'd get fired, their true beliefs. Well, so I think every, some of that might be, uh, first of all, if you're, if you're a journalist in a student newspaper and they say, we can't tell you the truth because we'll get fired, your next question next time that happens might be, oh, can you give me a name of somebody who was fired and did that? Because yeah. I think you'll hear cricket sounds. So that, <laughs> Go ahead. But I also have a chemistry teacher who went against what the common core was kind of, is very strict, and he was going against that. He was very, just open discussion, not everything was textbooks, and not everything was PowerPoints, and guess what happened? He got fired. He got fired for not, he either got so much pressure put on, he either quit, or he got what, fired. Was he not tenured? Was he brand new? Uh, he was pretty new to that school. He oh. had been. Uh, he was also a college professor, so he saw it that way too. So he tried to teach too close to that. Huh. So huh. the whole system was just topsy turvy, and it, Chrissy's trying to get rid of Common Core, but uh, I think that's a big proponent in why it's so just bleak and terrible in that place for everybody, students included. Right. Well, so I mean, I don't. I can't speak to these individual teacher examples you're giving, but um, uh, I would just say that. Um, you should also look at some of the teacher interviews that we do in, in New Jersey also, who uh, some of them are in the parent interviews, who say the teachers are fantastic at some of the charter schools, for example, that we, go, that are, that we send our kids to. We love the teachers. In fact, we have a video re we just released where a parent compares, and students, uh, uh, the children in the family, compare the teachers in the charter and the district school. And you can hear them say that they just care more in the charter school. And so, uh, you know, and so, 
I mean, the, the, and the charter schools there are also subject to the same testing environment. So it's, it's probably more to the story, is all I'm trying to say. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. I uh, spent the very first part of my career as a public school teacher, and then since I wasn't doing so well, a parochial school teacher, and I taught chemistry at one point at the parochial school. Um, so I won't, uh, I guess what, I, what counts is my observations, not, nothing to do with my ability, which apparently isn't that great. But um, when the students are failing, it's, uh, it's just the parents. Uh, the parents aren't involved. And when you see students succeed, either A, they have a strong individual motivation, or B, the parents have gotten behind them. And that ties in with the oh, culture that's reflected by my parents, uh, or my dad in particular, which is uh, shove the kid out the door, he's going to get educated, it's foolish to spend money, and it's, you don't really need to you know, encourage him. The teachers are there for that. And uh, it, education should just happen, and uh, we don't, really don't care about it. Right. So, I, so and, and this is I'll this feeds question. into the political environment of, uh, let's say, the Democratic Party, for example. Uh, so this is really a big cultural problem. And the other observation I made. Um, well, let me just address that. So in yeah. terms of parents, people often say, but it's it's the parents, right? So yeah. all this is just basically the difference in these schools is just difference in parents. In fact, there are places, while it's true, anyone who studies this subject will tell you parental involvement is the number one predictor of student success. So no one dies that. No one questions that parents are really important in making education a priority in a household, right? That's critically important. But at the same time, you can take the same kid, and we've done it, who has had the same parents the whole time, and they've gone from one failing school to another really great school, whether it's a charter, private school, some other environment, and it saved their lives. They talk about it. This week, a girl cried to us, wept on camera, about the consistent and continuous vicious bullying she was getting in her public school that no one would do anything about. And then she now transferred and is now uh, starting in 10th grade, which was just the last school year for her, in a Catholic school. And she says, this is like a young teenage girl who says, I have a second chance at life. I mean, suicidal people are trapped in some of these other schools, and then they switch to a better school, and it's a whole new day for them. So they had the same parents. She had the same parents, all right? So, the, so, so don't be too quick to dismiss how a school is run and how that can affect kids. To subscribe to us, etc. Uh, so, again, my name is Bob Bowden, and I'll be around all day. So, see you guys around. Thanks.